Good afternoon. Thanks again for coming to uh, CSIS on this balmy Wednesday afternoon in November, December. Um, you know, it's given me a, 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 a lot of pleasure to be here today and, and to introduce Bill Brock, who's going to kick us off. But before I do, I really want to thank the Alcoa Foundation for its contribution to uh, what has been a, a pretty interesting series of events that we've held here on competitiveness and, and manufacturing. Um, today we're going to be talking a little bit about um, about uh, industrial policies in some other key countries that are emerging as potential competitors, and or if if one likes to think of it that way. Um, but uh, the person who uh, is going to to moderate and chair the session is um, really doesn't need a whole lot of introduction. Bill Brock has uh, uh, been a senator, a USTR, uh, Secretary of Labor, and and we're most uh, proud of the fact that he's here at CSIS on a increasing basis and chairs our international policy roundtable. So let me introduce to you to, uh, to uh, Bill Brock. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for coming. I, uh, just for the record, we've been having, this is the third of this particular series that uh, Alcoa was kind, uh, kind enough to uh, support at the at the beginning and what we've been looking at for those of you that have not been able to do the earlier two sessions is basically uh, the global economy the context that that uh, establishes for uh, the United States and for those partners that we have around the world and particularly we've been looking at the question of how does this different world fundamentally different world. Uh, how does it change the way we look at the conduct and composition of both domestic and international economic policy? It's, uh, you gotta be my age to realize just how fast the world has changed and how much it's changed. I, I try to tease my children or college st students when I'm talking by asking the question, you know, how long has the internet been around? And uh, people say 20, 30 years. Most of them it's been around longer than they have. And when you say, well, it's only 15 years old in terms of its application or availability for, for the people of this country, it's really hard to understand the transformation that has brought, that that has brought. And it's, it's very difficult when you look at this country and it's a, a political makeup, and I'm not talking about the dysfunctional nature of, of this town at the, in the last few years, but just in terms of the way uh, we compose and agree upon our relations with other countries, our domestic policies, um, there are a lot of people who argue that it's really tough for a system like ours to be as able to adapt to this changing world as some of our competitors are. And we, we began by looking, and I guess, John, in the first session we had about uh, uh, how, we, uh, how we address everything from currency issues to the potential for uh, trade protectionism. Uh, could we, as a country, afford not to engage in some of the practices that some of our competitors engage in. Uh, and if we could, how would we do it? Or if we couldn't, what would be the alternative? Uh, should we address, address uh, changes in policy areas that would give us more flexible tools to, to adapt? Uh, the last session we had, we looked at, uh, at defense and the importance of the defense base in this country, which is continuing and, and strong, uh, and its importance to manufacturing writ large in this country. So today we're moving to uh, uh, four specific countries that uh, may, uh, allow, which can give us some examples of what others are doing, and on the basis of that, think about what that implies for us. Um, the questions I'm sure you've seen in your agenda uh, will begin with uh, 
what is the competitive environment in these four countries, Brazil, China, Germany, and Russia? How has that evolved over the past decade or so? What are their policy approaches for stimulating a manufacturing? And how is their policy-making environment responding to perceived uh, theirs or ours successes and failures? So uh, it's, a, it's an adequate agenda for an afternoon's conversation. And we've got some, some really wonderfully uh, able people that I will give you a, a very brief uh, mention of their credentials, which are extensive. Uh, otherwise, we could spend the whole meeting talking about what they've done. But uh, let me begin by Rick Burt, who was former ambassador to uh, Germany, managing director of uh, McClarty & Associates. Uh, he came to McKinsey before McClarty as a, after successfully concluding a nuclear arms treaty uh, as the chief negotiator in the strategic arms reduction talks with the former Soviet Union. Prior to that, of course, he was the U.S. ambassador to the Federal Republic of Germany in the uh, late 80s. And Charles Freeman, uh, most of you would be thoroughly familiar with Charles. He holds a Freeman Chair in China Studies here at SESIS. He concentrates on the political economy of China and other parts of East Asia and U.S.-China relations, particularly trade and economic. Um, Andrew Kitchens just came in. Welcome. Uh, yeah, we were dragging him from, from one meeting to the next. <laughs> You're good to come. <coughs> He's a senior fellow and director of the CSIS Russia and Eurasia program. He's an internationally renowned expert on Russian foreign and domestic policies. He publishes widely uh, books, papers, and a number of, uh, of uh, contributions to the, to the debate and understanding of Russia. Uh, Kelly Meeman Hawk, former 10 years, Kelly has, been, uh, has led the Brazilian Southern Core and Trade Practices of McClarty Associates. She previously uh, worked at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, my old stomping ground, as director for Brazil and the Southern Cone, where she had primary responsibility for Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Paraguay, and Uruguay. She leads the Trade Facilitation Task Force of the U.S.-Brazil Business Council. So uh, we have an awful lot of talent, and what I'll ask them to do, uh, each in turn, uh, to give you 5, 10, 15 minutes, whatever they're comfortable with, to uh, sketch out uh, each of the countries that they're going to present. And then we will uh, open the conversation to all of us for, uh, for questions, uh, express, expressions of, uh, of concern and suggestions, if I might. So, Kelly, if I can begin with you, we'll uh, kick it off. Great. Thank you so much, Bill. And I've got a PowerPoint. I'm not sure how that will come up. Yeah, there we go. Are you, are you my clicker? Yeah. No, I can click it. No, I'll click it. This one? Yep. Got it. Great. Thanks. Um, super. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here today with such a distinguished panel at CSIS and, and to address you all a bit on Brazil's perspective on industrial policy. thought I'd just go through a PowerPoint presentation quickly. Um, Brazil really comes at industrial policy not as a, as a you know, new innovation. This is something that is really in Brazilian DNA. If you look, uh, it's a little bit small up there, but during the time of the, the military uh, regime in Brazil, which also ended uh, not that long ago, back in, in 85, um, and, and look at the 70s when the Brazilian so-called economic miracle took place, a lot of that was due to uh, industrial planning and industrial policy. Of course, that was back in uh, kind of the bad old days, if you will, of uh, import substitution and industrialization, the Raul Prebisch theory, uh, and uh, not the most sustainable uh, way to industrialize, but layer that on top of uh, in the pre-military regime days, uh, the fact that there was already this penchant towards uh, developing rather large state-owned industries uh, and state-owned enterprises, uh, many of which during the privatization period we look at today, and those are the multi-Brasis, these uh, multinational, new multinational Brazilian companies that have become uh, real powerhouses. Many of them have roots back in this period 
uh, both pre-military period and, and ISI period of uh, very intense, very planned industrial policy. Uh, then, you know, obviously the 80s, everything kind of froze for a bit during that lost decade of both uh, debt crisis and hyperinflation. Uh, and then in the 90s, things really turned a bit. Um, you had uh, Brazil opening itself up, uh, in many cases unilaterally, through uh, tariff reductions, privatizing many of those uh, previously state-held SOEs, uh, starting to engage in trade agreements, uh, developing the Mercosur Agreement, uh, both for their own uh, interests and also to some extent as a response to NAFTA. Um, and that opening really did take an economy which had been extremely, extremely protected and uh, with uh, just an abysmally low percentage of GDP relying on trade and uh, did force in a number of those industries uh, an increased competitiveness. They still were, you know, from a free trader's perspective, quite protected. Uh, but in comparing it to, uh, you know, the, those uh, 1970s days of when industrial policy originated, uh, this really was a new innovation for Brazil. And so how did they leverage that more outward-looking orientation then? I mean, really, the, the, the game changer in Brazil, as many of you, I'm sure, know, was having a stable currency and nipping in the bud hyperinflation, which had plagued them for decades. Um, the Real Plan came uh, into play in July. Uh, of 94, and that really did allow Brazilians for the first time, um, because of, of the elimination or at least controlling, uh, well, elimination of hyperinflation and controlling of inflation, um, to uh, plan their, their consumption to be more uh, outward looking, um, even more so in their orientation. Um, you saw more interlocking supply chains between the United States and Europe. Um, and then, um, you know, you really did, uh, and this is obviously more recent uh, and a big part of Brazil's uh, boom economically here over the last 10 years has been the emergence of China, Asian, and Middle Eastern markets uh, as a, a, a home for uh, Brazilian products, primarily still uh, a lot of basic goods, uh, inputs, agricultural uh, products, et cetera. Uh, but a real uh, diversification away from what, again, historically used to be an industrial policy driven towards uh, really producing for the Brazilian market and starting to think about, okay, how do we uh, take these policies and look at how we can conquer other markets as well? And, um, I, you know, I might be giving a little bit too much uh, credit to uh, Minister Furlan, who was uh, Lula's first commerce minister, but I really don't think so. I mean, he uh, historically ran um, what's one of the largest poultry interests in Brazil, uh, Sagia, and really came to the position of commerce minister uh, looking at it as, you know, a sales guy. Uh, you know, he had spent his entire career going around the world selling chicken <laughs> to people from, uh, you know, countries uh, throughout the globe. And he really attacked his job as commerce minister with that same perspective, um, but looking cross-sectorally across the Brazilian uh, economy and thinking, okay, what, what can we do to outreach better to other markets and really uh, really sell better and connect better with other markets. Another piece uh, I put down there, Apex, ABDI, and a more aggressive BNDS. Apex and ABDI are two entities that uh, developed uh, under uh, uh, really the, the, the leadership. I would say they, a couple of them originated under the previous administration, but uh, were really deepened under uh, President Lula and under uh, Furlan, um, and those entities were designed to really help to foment and grow um, certain sectors of uh, the Brazilian economy, be it uh, you know, cosmetics, aerospace, telecommunications, et cetera. Certain uh, sectors were identified, and those agencies were designed to really help to think, how can we make these sectors more competitive? And also BNDS, that's the Brazilian Development Bank, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but they became increasingly aggressive as well. So you had these really pro-growth policies that came with the opening of the Brazilian economy, the diversification of their export markets, um, and, you know, all of that kind of running gangbusters. Um, and, and, you know, that included the factors that I've got here on the first point. You had... Um, Brazil really investing in growing their middle class. You've got um, the conditional cash transfer programs um, that have been, uh, much has been made of them and, and with a lot of reason. Um, the Bolsa Familia program that 
uh, provides as long as you are you know sending your kids to school, getting them vaccinated, et cetera, uh, provides a certain um, uh, bolsa scholarship, bunch of money for your family uh, to be able to uh, to to sustain themselves. Um, you had already had pre-crisis an increasing reliance on state-owned banks to keep credit flowing. Uh, you already had an increasing infrastructure uh, focus by the Brazilian government through the PAC, which is the Program for Accelerated Growth, uh, which, again, even pre-crisis had been announced to try to address some of the um, infrastructure shortcomings because as Brazil has uh, started to grow uh, increasingly quickly over the last decade, it's been increasingly clear how uh, much they really do need to focus on port, uh, transportation, et cetera, et cetera, infrastructure, and the PAC was designed to try to address that. Um, you already had industrial policy, um, again, as I'd mentioned before, focusing on three uh, certain key sectors through what they call the PDP, uh, which, uh, again, is, a, is a, a policy that identifies uh, 10 different sectors and says, all right, these are the sectors that we are going to focus on through giving tax benefits to uh, export incentives, et cetera, and trying to make those really some of the core uh, cornerstones of, of our economy going forward. You also had R&D. I mean, we're talking here about manufacturing, but I think it's important to also highlight that as part of the Brazilian industrial policy, they did not forget about R&D software. Um, there uh, is an incredible amount of money that's being set aside through BNDS and other sources to try to incent at this time uh, increased software development uh, within Brazil, and that's a, a sector that actually has been doing um, you know, uh, really, really growing uh, in an impressive way. You've got Google uh, with an R&D center in uh, the state of Minas Gerais. You've got, uh, over the last year, both GE and IBM announced uh, new R&D centers in Brazil. So th this, is, this is truly bearing fruit. Um, and then tax incentives, as I mentioned. Um, there's, a, there's a tax in Brazil called the IPI, which is up there, um, which uh, is developed and designed to really um, try to incent local production. That's uh, localizing production is uh, an, an incredibly large focus of a lot of the Brazilian industrial policy, be it through the Development Bank. In order to get funding um, from the Development Bank that I mentioned before, you have to have at least 60% local content, um, not unlike some of the stipulations that we have here with our own XM. Um, but relevant to note, IPI, if you're not um, producing locally, if you're importing a product that is produced locally, then you'll have an extra, this extra IPI tax layered on top of what you're already, uh, the other multitudinous taxes that you're already paying in Brazil, uh, which is, is one of the challenges uh, in Brazil is, is the complex tax code. But they do use that complex tax code in a lot of different situations to try to uh, incent certain industries and promote their industrial policy. So that 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 was really the state of play pre-crisis. And then you then you, you've got all those pro-growth policies. They hit the financial crisis. What does that do? That really gives Brazil uh, an opportunity to take advantage of the fact that they had at the time the crisis hit. They had about 200 billion dollars in reserves. They're in a very um, positive uh, situation uh, in that they they had that chunk of money. They had. Uh, really the, the, the policy space and the economic space to be able to invest. And this gives you a little bit of an idea here how they invested that stimulus money. Um, you know, about $10 billion of it went just to try to uh, support the state-owned banks, be it BNDES, Banco do Brasil, Caixa Econômica Federal, in um, being sure that they were able to keep credit flowing. Uh, you, uh, that IPI that I mentioned before, in many industries, be it construction, autos, et cetera, where the government deemed that it was important to uh, the Brazilian economy to kind of keep consumption flowing, keep construction going, they uh, put in place uh, tax exemptions uh, of the IPI and others to try to, to keep that moving forward. Uh, continued the sectoral targets uh, that I had mentioned before, but with a special focus on these that I have here, banking, auto, uh, the auto industry, housing, construction, agriculture. And then again, and particularly because over this time frame that we're discussing, you had um, the awarding of both the World Cup for 2014 and the Olympics for 2016 to Brazil. So you had an even more intense pressure to focus on the infrastructure question. So uh, you look at all of uh, the ways that they channeled the money either through state PACs, uh, uh, programs, which is that program for accelerated growth, the infrastructure program, federal financing through BNDS, Petrobras is kind of an animal of it, in and of itself, especially post uh, pre-salt fines um, uh, where they are uh, investing incredibly 
uh, in various industrial uh, projects to uh, to, to get uh, that oil out of the ground. So you've got a lot of uh, a lot of money flowing and a lot of um, kind of renewed focus um, as far as having a state-led role in being sure that a lot of these industrial projects and policies were being well funded. So you look at this. You know, what are the questions going forward? I mean, addressing the 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 question of the uh, of the panel here, useful model or sustain, uh, sustainable success. I think that there are a lot of things here that that do show that uh, there are elements of what Brazil has done um, that do provide uh, useful points to model off of. Um, I've highlighted here, though, some of the questions that I think we need to address going forward to really, I, I don't think you can call the Brazil case writ large a useful model until you address some of these questions that I've got here. Um, and the number one structural roadblock, at least for me, is, is education. Um, it's the fact that you, know, you can put all the tax incentives that you want on growing R&D and, and software industries, et cetera. You've got to have those engineers to staff those places. And so um, this is something that um, has uh, been kind of the, the reform of always, the reform that's always been needed to, to be done uh, in Brazil. Uh, hopefully it'll be something that uh, incoming President Rousseff can address. Um, federal spending. Um, a lot of those programs that I've highlighted thus far in the presentation, it's a lot of government spending on the part of Brazil. And um, it does create an inflationary threat, which in the Brazilian psyche is a big deal, uh, given the, the history of hyperinflation. I've got 10% versus 5%. If you look at what they're projecting uh, for growth of uh, government spending, growth of the, the federal budget next year, it's a 10% growth rate. Compare that to 5% <coughs> inflation rate. Thank you. Um, that's uh, pledged for next year, and you can see that this is going to continue to be uh, an issue and in the, in the, the overly strong hail and their ability to therefore continue to grow exports um, to some of these diversified markets that they've opened up um, is, is going to be challenged by the overly strong hail. And as much as you heard around the G20 meetings, uh, Minister Mantega and others, the finance minister of Brazil and others talking about this uh, challenge of, you know, guerra cambiao, you know, the, the currency war. Um, at the end of the day, Brazil is going to have to address this issue of, of the level of public sector spending um, in order to, just within their own house, address uh, the issue of the overvalued rail and the impact that that has on their industrial sectors and their export uh, possibilities. Another question that a lot of analysts are asking right now is, is, is there an over-reliance on the state-owned banks? Is this somehow going to have a, a, a lasting impact on the ability to, to finance long-term projects? You see uh, you know, the extent to which uh, BNDS, the development bank, has been uh, capitalized just over the last 10 years. It used to be $9 billion back in 2000. Now it's about $25 billion. Um, the uh, FDI and export diversification factor, this is a positive. Will that continue? Um, you know, China uh, now this year is uh, $20 billion is what they're looking to uh, invest uh, in Brazil. And that's, uh, you know, a, a really groundbreaking number for them. They've never been uh, up, up uh, at the, that high of levels before. Um, infrastructure projects, we talked about that before. Where will that money go? Will it be spent, you know, whenever you've got that much money flowing, that many projects going, are you spending intelligently? And that's a question that... A a lot of people are watching right now. And then the final point that I'll make that I, I see as just a, a overall risk in industrial policy, not just in Brazil, but I would say also here in the United States, is this trending towards binational policies. Um, obviously, we had our, our Buy America, uh, and in a sense, that did um, kind of open the door to other countries pursuing similar policies. The Brazilians have a binational policy. It's, it was done by presidential decree. Uh, and, and just passed by their Congress last week or approved by their Congress last week um, that does uh, impose a number of um, government procurement benefits on, on locally produced uh, products and services. Um, I guess the question for me is where does that trend continue? I mean, you know, right now we've got some of the larger markets, U.S., Brazil, uh, that have put in these binational uh, policies, but when you've got your largest export market for Brazil being Argentina, what if Argentina you know, in January decides to do a Buy Argentina bill, where does this end and what impact does that have on Brazilian industries? So I, I think I'll leave it there and leave anything else to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Charles? Thank you. I'm not nearly as organized as Kelly, so don't have a PowerPoint. <laughs> so I'm just going to tell a story. Um, you know, I think that the, the, uh, the questions that are raised at the outset here, and even, even in the title, looking at, at Brazil, China, Germany, and Russia's industrial policy, useful models, sustainable success. I think that's a really, it's a very interesting question applied to China because 
Um, I'm not sure we know what the China model is, and I'm not sure that we know whether the current success is sust was sustainable in China if China decides that its, its model is something that then perhaps it's not. And clearly, I mean, right now, particularly in the wake of the global financial crisis, China is feeling extremely good about itself. It had a very targeted, fairly well-designed stimulus package that actually was stimulus and not merely transfer payments um, internally, internally, actually was directed at, at, uh, at infrastructure and, and, and other, other areas that really will generate economic activity for some time. So fairly successful um, model of a stimulus package in the, in this, in the middle of a crisis. But what happened as a result of the crisis and China's sense of its relative rise respective to the United States was a perception that the Washington consensus, which um, even if China never really embraced that consensus, China always held out the Washington consensus as sort of an ideal model of what you'd really do if you wanted to have an economy that was clicking on all cylinders if you had the political um, uh, elbow room to, to, to do it. Uh, in the wake of the crisis, the, the Washington consensus in China was completely discredited, and people actually started talking about something that might be a, a Beijing consensus or a, at least a China model or maybe more, more correctly a China approach to things. And if you, if you talk to Chinese scholars or officials about the China approach or the China model, uh, you get a variety of different answers about what that is. And not, not a lot of people can identify it with any specificity. But what people will tell you generally is that a cornerstone of the China model is state-directed capitalism, i.e., the model of that was used in the stimulus package during the recent crisis, i.e., the state directing capitalism to, to achieve um, industrial policy ends. And, and that's, um, you know, that's, that's a, an interesting question whether that truly is the China model. Uh, really, for, for 30 plus years, China has generated double digit growth, and I'm not sure that that was a result, as a result of, of, of state directed capitalism. Indeed, if you look at, at um, state directed activities, particularly through the state owned enterprises, state owned enterprises for the past 20 years or so have consumed 70% of the resources and only produced about 30% of the output which is, you know, the, the precise reverse for the private sector or the, or the non-state sector in China. So the question is whether state-directed capitalism as it goes through the, the state sector is really what, what is driving new growth in China. Certainly, there are a lot of people in China who believe it is. And certainly, really, going back to the end of, of 2001 when China first joined the WTO, there are a lot of people in China who have been active in producing industrial policies designed <coughs> To, uh, to stimulate the economy in a wide range of sectors. And anybody who has spends any time with the Chamber of Commerce or the U.S.-China Business Council or anyone who spends any time in boardrooms that have anything to do with China is quite familiar with the, um, the, the, the gnashing of teeth and wringing of hands as a result of some of these, these industrial policies. And they, they run the gamut, again, from direct stimulus of Chinese industry um, in ways that discriminate against uh, against foreign business uh, interests in, in China, um, anti-competition policies which are designed to reduce uh, monopolistic uh, powers in quotes of, of foreign actors in the marketplace, um, the use of technical standards that are designed to stimulate um, either uh, Chinese enterprises that produce these standards uniquely or force uh, 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 foreign companies to produce in China according to these standards. Um, you know, direct subsidies of, of research and development, again, in the name of producing Chinese innovation that, that grows uh, domestic Chinese companies that uh, can compete on the global stage uh, for te in technology circles and the like, um, and procurement policies that are, that are designed, again, to largely stimulate uh, higher technology, higher value added Chinese production. Um, one can certainly point to the, the, if one chooses, to the exchange rate policy um, as a uh, industrial policy. It certainly has a primary um, effect, if not intent, and I think the intent is there as well, to uh, to benefit Chinese exporters um, and and continue to preserve some margin for those exporters in international trade that allows them to be competitive. Not necessarily with all deference to people like Fred Bergston with U.S. producers, um, but uh, but certainly other. Uh, exporters from Asia and possibly from Latin America and, and increasingly from, from Africa at least at some point down the road. Um, and finally, one can also, if one chooses, and I think um, there's something there, 
uh, uh, call lax enforcement of intellectual property rights in China um, a, um, a policy designed to at least stimulate uh, Chinese production through the use of, of property that is not theirs, um, one, can, one can say that perhaps this is not a coherent um, a policy from the top, that it is an, 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 a policy by effect rather than intent, but it certainly um, the lax enforcement of intellectual property rights in China to has a, a direct impact on the, the competitive uh, abilities of, of, of Western firms in China and, and, and arguably throughout the world and, and almost certainly is a, is a primary, uh, should be a primary concern for those of us that still believe that United States technology and, and innovation is a, a primary United States competitive advantage. Um, all of this said, if you look at all of these industrial policies to date, policies to date, it's very hard to find a lot of success. Even though, I mean, a lot there's a lot of gnashing of teeth and wringing of hands by by foreign uh, firms in the marketplace that say it's very difficult to compete with with some of these firms that are getting benefits from from uh, uh, from the Chinese government in the form of subsidies or 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 other policies that, that stimulate um, their advantage, it's hard to find a whole lot of successes in there. You can certainly point to some, um, but even those where there is, there, there is clear, clear uh, production successes or export successes like in solar panels and the like, it's hard to find a whole lot of profit there. So again, if, you're, if your goal is to produce companies which can undersell um, others in, in globally, China's having some success at that. It's hard to find, though, a sustainable business model when you are losing money on the order that some of these companies are. I want to give an example of an industrial policy specifically in China, its impact on the marketplace, and, um, and, and well, some of the challenges that it presents, not only for, for foreign competitors in that, in that market, but also for Chinese competitors. Um, the Chinese government, uh, for reasons uh, good and just, um, and, uh, and also in order to stimulate domestic Chinese production of green technology, declared that they wanted a certain percentage of wind energy as part of the overall energy mix in China. Um, overnight, you had, um, whereas the, the day before you had this announcement, you had, I think, three or four uh, Chinese wind turbine producers, uh, some of which were, were OK. Um, all of a sudden, anybody that had ever produced a gearbox or something that looked like a, a that, that could rotate or anything that could be put on a pole was a wind turbine producer in China. So today you have something like 80 wind turbine producers in China. This is not a sustainable model. You, you, this is not a market, or even the global market can't sustain 80 wind turbine producers. Yet as a result of this process, 80 were created. Now a company that goes into that marketplace, and there are many Western companies that go in, because of concerns about intellectual property, they go into that marketplace and they say, okay, the, we don't want to sell tomorrow's technology, um, uh, we don't want to sell today's technology in today in China. We would prefer to sell yesterday's technology because we can, at least we, we, we have a better sense that our current technology will be, will be preserved. So they go into the marketplace and they say, okay, we want to sell an 850 megawatt turbine in this market. Well, the Chinese customer knows that in Europe or the United States, the same company is selling a 1.5 gigawatt uh, uh, turbine, and so they want that. They want that one. I mean, they want the best, they want the finest, and they have the ability to pay for it. Well, no one will sell. No one from the foreign companies will sell that to them. So the Chinese companies say we can build a bigger turbine, and they produce it. And so they sell a 1.5 gigawatt turbine in the marketplace. It's not good. Uh, the chances of failure are significant, but it's a big turbine. And that's what our, our companies, in many cases, are competing with. So that the, 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 the impact, um, because of the, the initial industrial policy, is you get a lot of producers who can't produce on any profit margin at all, and who are certainly going to undersell global competition because, uh, they're, they're, it's because the competitive environment is so, is so shrill. You've got um, uh, substandard quality being produced in the marketplace by groups that really don't have the technology or the management to produce according to global scale. Is this a sustainable model? I'm not sure. Out of, out of these 80, um, 80 producers in China, are, are three or four or five or six going to be successful and emerge? One would think at a certain point that the Chinese would consolidate the overcapacity, the Chinese government would consolidate the overcapacity and bring it down to six or, or five or six companies. But the problem is, because of local 
protectionism in China because provinces and municipalities all have their favorite companies. It's very difficult for Beijing to effectively quash the goals of these local, local, uh, local governments uh, to preserve their own, um, not just national champion, but, but provincial champion in, in wind turbine production. And so it's very difficult to consolidate that production. Now, what will happen long term? Well, you know, the local, the local governments may continue to subsidize and support these, these companies, but they're all going to drift along. And, and I'm not certain that that is a sustainable business model. Ultimately, I, I think the, the lesson that the Chinese have learned from the financial crisis, that state-directed capitalism is the Chinese model of success, is completely the reverse. The Chinese model, and the one that has been so successful for so, so long, has been an in, intense uh, uh, focus on reforming um, um, to allow the market to play the primary role in Chinese policy. Getting out of the way of the average Chinese citizens, and particularly in the private sector, to, to produce um, a products that make his or her life better and his or her child's life better has been the primary uh, generator of success in China for the past 30 years. Now, there are challenges with, with uh, with uh, unchecked, unregulated uh, market reform, certainly. And you can point to any number of disparities and dislocations in the Chinese marketplace, whether it's uh, environmental challenges, whether it's income disparity, whether it's regional and, and uh, rural urban uh, income disparities or development disparities. But it's very hard to, ar to argue that the reverse is the better, op the better option. I mean, frankly, industrial policies are what drove China from a relatively pre preferential uh, place in the global, uh, global economy in the early 1950s down to less than one percentage point of global GDP by 1978 when they had to give up and essentially allow um, the, uh, the, the market to take hold. So I, I, I'm, I'm cons considerably worried, frankly, and, and if I were in Beijing and, and I was a Chinese leader, um, thank heavens I'm not, because their problems are, are, are certainly greater than any of, of ours. Um, uh, I, I would be very nervous about the current approach to industrial policy making in China and the, the sense of, 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 um, of hu hubris, maybe too strong, but, but certainly pride in the notion of, of state-directed capitalism as, as the primary model for Chinese growth for going into the future. Thank you. Rick Bird. Uh, thank you, Bill. I, I guess I should begin by saying when I was uh, initially invited to uh, appear on this panel, I thought that somebody had gotten something very wrong. <laughs> because uh, what we have here are, are three of the four BRIC countries, and then you have Germany. And uh, and uh, the Germans, who, of course, would be uh, uh, would be the last to consider themselves a, an emerging market, and uh, and they certainly don't fit that category. They're probably best thought of as a, as a as a mature uh, market. But uh, given uh, the experience, uh, the German experience, uh, economic experience in the last 12 months. While they may not be a, an emerging market, I think you can consider them a renaissance market. And I want to uh, just demonstrate that by initially throwing out a few, uh, a few numbers. Uh, well, three percentages and one fraction. Uh, five, five percent, which is their estimated growth in uh, GDP this year. Fifteen percent which is their estimated growth of exports this year, 6%, which is their unemployment rate, and the fraction is one-third, which is the uh, share, uh, the German share of the overall uh, GDP of the European Union as a whole. Uh, the one thing the economic crisis, I think, has, uh, has underscored very dramatically, and you can tell that simply by reading the headlines from day to day uh, focused on the Euro crisis, is that they have emerged as the economic powerhouse uh, of Europe. Now, uh, it probably, uh, given uh, the, 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 the nature of their economy and their maturity, 
it, it probably doesn't make much sense to compare and contrast the German model, if you want to call it a model, with uh, Russia, China, Brazil, or India. So to the extent I'm going to be making comparisons and contrasts, it's going to be with the United States this afternoon, because I think there are some interesting ones. Uh, but to begin with, uh, I think it's important to understand that the, that the German economy and its approach to uh, industry is really focused by, I think, two critical historical experiences of the 20th century. The first, of course, is the, uh, the great inflation of the Weimar period in the 1920s uh, that has uh, burned deep into the consciousness of, of every German, not only because of its ruinous impact on uh, on the German economy and the dis destruction of, uh, of the then German middle class, but I think the, the widely uh, sh uh, held uh, uh, view in Germany that it paved the uh, way for uh, 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 the Third Reich and Adolf Hitler to come to power in the early 1930s. The second important shared his historical memory is the, uh, is the uh, immediate post-war period when uh, the Germans not only faced the daunting task of, re of reconstruction, but uh, what we often forget is the very real peril of, uh, of, of, of communism. And by this, I don't mean the Soviet military threat, but the, but the, the, the widely perceived threat that, uh, that, uh, that uh, far left uh, politics was going, to, uh, was going to dominate the German political scene. And uh, that produced, uh, uh, in, the, in the course of the 1950s, the middle of the 50s to the late 50s, the notion or the concept of what the Germans call their social market economy. The notion that Germany's economy needed to be driven by market forces. It needed to be driven by the private sector. But there had to be a, a, an ethos of, of social cohesion. Uh, to defend that system from the excesses uh, uh, from the left. And I think both of those, the, 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 if you want to understand the success of the German economy today, you need to understand those two shared experiences. Uh, a, a, a deep, deep fear of inflation, of deficit spending, of, of stimulus on the one hand, and on the other, a very important shared ethos of social cohesion, of social equity. I mean, one example of that is uh, the, the disparity, if you measure the disparity between the average salary of a German and the average salary of a, of a German CEO, and compare that in the United States, the average American salary to the average salary of an American CEO, the German figure is about one-tenth that of an American CEO. The Germans will not socially tolerate the tremendous divergence of salaries and wage, wages and wealth that, uh, that has come to characterize the United States. That just doesn't work. It's not socially acceptable in Germany. Now, as far as industrial strategy is concerned, there, there really is no industrial policy per se. But that isn't to say there isn't what I guess would be better framed in Germany as an industrial consensus. First, the first point about that consensus is a focus on exports. And the best way to portray that, and Charles has just talked about China, Germany with a population of 80 million people, and remember 20 of those 80 million people only recently joined the team from, uh, from the, the backward uh, East Germany, GDR, eight, uh, 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 an economy of 80 million people competes year in and year out with China to be the world's largest exporter. Germany is an export machine. Secondly, unlike the United States and, other, and some other European countries, most notably Britain, Germany continues to focus on its manufacturing prowess. It is a, uh, it's still, both in terms of large companies and middle-sized companies, the so-called Mittelstand, it produces stuff and sells it. And it's interesting how they've survived and, and, been, and been competitive in, in, in an era when new manufacturers have come from the fore 
to the fore from emerging markets is they focused on a very important niche, which I would call the high value added manufacturing niche. So if you want to buy uh, a machine tool and you want it to be the best machine tool, the most reliable machine tool, and yes, it's probably the most expensive machine tool, you typically are going to buy a German product. And that's what the Germans have carved out, and that they've had tremendous success selling those, the, their manufacturing product, whether it's <laughs> machine tools, whether it's ships, whether it's cars, to an, a growing market, not just the United States, it's European partners, uh, uh, Japan, but increasingly the emerging markets, to, they have had tremendous success selling those high value added manufactured products into an increasingly globalized economy. That is the key to the success of the, of the German model. Uh, they have done that by uh, maintaining excellent infrastructure. You can have, you can, uh, you, 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 their, their logistic systems, their transport systems, their railroad systems, their airports uh, are, uh, are uh, uh, at, the, at the cutting edge. And they have an interesting in, uh, mix between, as I was saying before, large uh, names like in uh, electronics and IT, Siemens, in financial services, uh, Allianz and Deutsche Bank. Uh, and, uh, and with the Mittelstand, the medium-sized companies who, uh, who play a very important role in terms of a backbone for, uh, for the German economy. What's the downside? The downside is there are no German Bill Gates. Germany is not a startup kind of place. In fact, there are regulations in Germany that even forbid you from starting a business in your own garage. But, uh, and, uh, and as the Germans like to say, if Bill G Gates had been born a German, he'd be a middle-level employee with Siemens. But, <laughs> hey, uh, their, uh, their ability to carve out their role within the global economy has been enormously successful. Now the role of government. The, one of the most interesting things that the Germans inherited from the, uh, from the uh, 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 Anglo-American occupation uh, of Germany in the late 40s and early 50s was a decentralized federal state. Uh, the Allies worried about the concentration of power in Berlin and, uh, and the centralization uh, gave Germany a federal system which has been uh, a great boon to the creation of a, of a diversified uh, economy with centers of excellence. So if you're in uh, Bavaria, in Munich, tends to be more of the high-tech center. Uh, if you're in Hamburg, that tends to be a media center. The center for chemicals, the, some of the traditional industries, is Dusseldorf. Frankfurt is a financial center. So the decentralization of, of, of Germany has, has served them well. And so, too, has the creation of a very good secondary school system. The Germans complain all the time about their universities, which they believe are not up, uh, are not, are not up to par with U.S. universities, and I think by and large they're correct. There, are no German, there is no German Ivy League. But at the same time, their secondary schools, in my judgment, and I think the, of most observers, are vastly superior to ours. So they are able to educate a, a large proportion uh, of their population that can, can perform in the workplace. And unlike the United States, they still have preserved a kind of apprenticeship programs, which, uh, which mean that, uh, that, uh, that their workers are in fact truly skilled workers. They're able to uh, produce, uh, produce this, these uh, highly, highly value added manufacturing equipment that uh, the Germans need to succeed uh, in the marketplace. They, and part of that approach to education is a tracked educational system. You have the students at a certain age, those who are bound to go on to university are going to go to a gymnasium, they're going to go to a school where they'll be prepared for college, 
those students that are going to be more and in, move into the blue collar world are going to be given a, a, an education that prepares them for uh, for that as well. Uh, uh, just a word about government business relations. Uh, there is not the kind of lobbying that occurs uh, companies engage uh, in here where people go see members of the uh, Bundestag or members of the, of the government uh, from different companies. Germany is very well organized for the most part into different industrial trade organizations, uh, associations that have more formal uh, ties into government. They, they provide information. They are, of course, given a campaign funding in Germany. Nobody can make political contributions to, uh, to candidates. So you don't have the kind of uh, uh, ability to kind of corrupt the system to the de degree that, uh, that, you, uh, that you have in, 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 this, in this country. At the same time, some of the large companies and large financial institutions do enjoy very good access to the top. And it's not uncommon for the Chancellor of Germany to have dinner with the CEO of the, uh, the speaker, as he's called, of the Deutsche Bank, or the CEO of Siemens or Allianz. But uh, this is part of, I think, an informal system of making sure that the government and business uh, stay on the, uh, stay on the uh, same wavelength. Finally, uh, uh, a word about this, this point I made earlier about social cohesion. It is, it is, uh, it is very, very important. Uh, it, politically, you don't and, and haven't had uh, the kind of political polarization and paralysis that you uh, can, can see in Washington today. In part, that's because the Germans, because of their own special history, don't trust a single party to come to power. And so nearly every government, post-war government, uh, German government has been a coalition. And uh, typically, a member, the, the, uh, a, uh, the minor partner in that coalition has been the, uh, have been the liberal party, the FDP, their kind of centrist, pro-free enterprise party, and they tended to swing back and forth between the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats. More recently now, of course, you have new parties, the Greens, the Linka. But it is the kind of uh, coalition uh, element of German politics that keeps radicalism and polarization uh, out of, out of, uh, out of uh, uh, German politics. So uh, uh, that, and again, this sort of emphasis on, on income distribution and not letting in get incomes get widely out of whack. So looking forward, what are the potential problems with this system that uh, seems to be working remarkably well right now? Well, one, like most European countries, you have the problem of uh, the demographics and an aging population. And one of the solutions, obviously, to that problem is immigration. And Germany is not an immigration country. It is not a country that has a tradition of welcoming, welcoming immigrants. Of course, uh, millions of Turkish guest workers came to Germany in the 1960s and 70s, and they make up today a, 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 a still an important fraction of, 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 the German, of the German population. But the Germans have not done a particularly good job of integrating that group. In fact, uh, Berlin is said to be the third largest uh, Turkish city in the world. And, uh, and, uh, but the Germans will have to attract uh, more immigrants, and that could very well lead to, uh, to, to frictions and, uh, and, and other problems. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the bottom line about Germany is it, it, it is not a dynamic society. It is not a society that is built for high economic growth and high risk. It is a steady, stable performer. And in time of economic crisis and uncertainty, it is, it is perfectly positioned for success. Thank you. Andrew? Thanks, Bill. <clears throat> well, what a contrast Russia is to Germany. <laughs> Russia is not a steady performer. Um, 
Although, like Germany, Russia does not have Bill Gates. They have Vladimir Putin, <laughs> who may well be more wealthy than Bill Gates, <laughs> or anybody else in the world for that matter. But I choose not to research that issue in much depth. That's why. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's great talking about, about Russia. Um, because one of my favorite comments was by, the, uh, by Will Rogers back in the 1930s. He said, Russia's the only country that no matter what you say about it, it's true. <laughs> and that's certainly the case when it comes to talking about the Russian economy. Uh, one can come to uh, wildly divergent conclusions. Um, but let me give it a go. Now, like... Uh, <clears throat> Like Rick, I kind of thought this was, good, was, a, was a brick conference. I didn't read the invitation closely enough to realize it was a <laughs> uh, meeting, whatever the uh, ac acronym is. But uh, Jim O'Neill of Goldman Sachs is a popular guy in Russia because the, uh, the original brick report that came out uh, seven, eight years ago uh, really was one of the most positive, was maybe the only positive uh, assessment of Russia done at the time. And Russia was very happy to be included in this category of rapidly growing, emerging, uh, emerging economies. Now, uh, particularly in the wake of the financial crisis and some of the difficulties that Russia has endured, a number of people have suggested that maybe we should take the R out of BRICS and make it BIC. Um, now, because I'm the last speaker and you've been sitting there for a long time, I'd like to do something interactive to start out with. So I'm going to ask you a question, and uh, the question is, you know, which of the BRIC economies do you think has seen the greatest uh, GDP growth uh, in dollar terms over the last decade? Okay? I'll name the country, and then you can raise, raise your hand. I've never done this before, but I'm kind of curious to see what the, uh, how, you, how you come out on this. Okay, how many people think that China uh, saw the greatest GDP growth? in the last decade? Raise your hand, please. Okay, three, five, nine, 12, okay, that's up about 20 plus or so. Uh, India, one, okay. Brazil, none. Russia, okay, about, uh, about 10. Well, let's go to the, the answer, please. Uh, okay, the answer is Russia, and it's by a long shot. A long shot. Uh, you, this should be a color graph, and I, uh, this is uh, from my uh, friend and colleague Cliff Gaddy at the Brookings Institution, uh, who I regularly steal his, uh, his graphic materials. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> he knows it, though. Uh, he says I could actually explain his graphs better than he can. But um, the, you know, Russia's there is the, is the, first, the, 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 first, the first one. And you look at that dramatic growth. Now, it took a big hit uh, in the financial crisis, 2008 to 2009. But nevertheless, uh, its performance has been dramatically uh, greater, better than in dollar terms than the other three, other three bricks. What's been driving it? Uh, initially, part of it was the devaluation of the ruble post-98 financial crisis. Uh, the results of uh, uh, restructuring that took place in response to reforms in the 1990s, uh, early 2000s, uh, played, a, played a big role. And uh, certainly the rise of the oil price played a, played a big role. Um, let's go to the next. Uh, oh, there we go. This is my favorite. Uh, graphic. It's also also cliffs. Now, if I had one graphic to show about Russia, this this would this would be this would be the one. Okay, so this is the what this uh, line shows is the uh, the amount of revenue uh, from oil and gas sales estimated coming into the Russian coming into the Russian economy going back to 1970. Uh, as you can see, things were good in the beginning of the Brezhnev period. You had the first oil crisis, the second oil crisis. They kind of peaked around 1980, 19, 1979, 80, 81. Uh, things weren't so good during the Gorby Yeltsin, Yeltsin times. And Vladimir the Lucky 
you can see what happened while he was, uh, while he was pres president. And um, I think the best estimate uh, of to what extent the, uh, uh, the, this increase in revenues contributes to, uh, to growth, growth in Russia is it, it, it estimated somewhere between a third and a third and one half of the uh, of, of growth. But this this uh, this high low oil price, um, high low revenue in intake also, it uh, it corresponds very closely with high oil price, um, less incentive for structural economic reform, as was the case in the uh, the Brezhnev period, and is, has been in the case in the particularly the, uh, the second uh, Putin administration, uh, <clears throat> less political openness, pluralism, um, and a more aggressive uh, Russian-Soviet foreign policy. Uh, I mean, just coincidentally, uh, the two peaks of those, of those periods around 1980 and uh, 2008 almost course, fairly closely correspond with the two times that Russian military forces have been used abroad in the last uh, uh, 30 plus years in Afghanistan and, uh, and Georgia. But this gives you an idea, this, this graph also, uh, you know, tracks very closely uh, economic growth and, 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 and fall, et cetera. Now, still, uh, Oil and gas is going to be the, the, the biggest determinant of uh, Russian economic performance. Uh, and what is that uh, likely to look at by, according to the most authoritative uh, um, estimates of oil price? Whoops, what happened there? Travis, I need some help. There we go. There we go. Thank you. I'll just say next, please, okay? Thank you. All right. Uh, the this is the, uh, the the similar graphic that I showed you before, but then at a $50 oil price, $130 oil price, $200 oil price, sort of the the uh, different scenarios of for from the I, IEA for oil price out to t out to 2030, uh, you can see the the impact of the the revenue that would be coming into um, into Russia as a result. Even at the relatively low $50 oil price, you know, Russia is not going to do all that, all that badly. Uh, and if you get at the higher oil, oil price scenarios, then uh, you know, you're going to see uh, actually considerably more robust economic performance. Now, there's a lot more to the story than that, but, um, but that's a big piece. Uh, so let's skip these. One, skip, skip. Okay. Now. The problem for the Russians, of course, is, uh, I mean, Russia's unique in many ways. Uh, Russia is the largest economy in the world, which is so dependent upon this one factor, and which contributes to the great volatility of Russian economic performance. And not only, uh, let's not forget that Russian, Russians, Russia went bankrupt twice in the 1990s, 1991 and 1998. And even uh, and then they experienced this extraordinary period of economic growth, where in real dollar terms, the economy was growing at about 25, 26, 27 percent a year in real dollar terms. because so that takes into account economic growth plus appreciate, currency appreciation. Um, that's how you get those, those big numbers. And <clears throat> they were feeling on top of the world in July of 2008 when the oil price hit its all-time high of, what, $145, $147 a barrel. And they were talking about, uh, they were looking with a lot of schadenfreude at the United States, and uh, this is the uh, subprime mortgage crisis was starting to uh, have a larger impact on the American, American economy. Oh, those poor Americans, ha, ha, ha. Uh, but we Russians, we think we are an island of stability. We are a safe haven. Uh, they were talking about this. Well, they got a rude awakening with the impact of the uh, global economic crisis, uh, and it was pretty much, pretty much starting with the... Uh, uh, the bankruptcy of uh, Lehman Brothers in mid 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 September, and if you look at the this graph, uh, shows the performance of the uh, the G20 economies, and Russia was the worst 
the relatively the worst performer of all the G20 economies, and that they experienced the greatest change in uh, from growth to uh, uh, increase to decrease in their economy, about a 15 percent change uh, in one year. And that's what puts them in that, that bottom right-hand right -hand corner. And again, it you know, re-emphasized for them something they already realized, the, uh, the dangers of uh, over-reliance on natural commodity and uh, ener especially ener energy exports. And they had, uh, even before the economic crisis hit, they had, uh, under, uh, while Putin was still president, they'd put together their uh, economic uh, goals to the year 2020, and they drew up three scenarios. And one scenario was the, uh, the, relative, was the, the least uh, optimistic scenario, and it was um, about 3% about growth per year. And there was a mid-level scenario at about 5%. Then the so-called innovation scenario, which called for about 7% growth uh, per year, which is in, in uh, uh, what the Russian economy was experiencing for the, the previous decade, if you take out the, uh, the, currency, the currency appreciation. And it was what they called the innovation scenario. Uh, and it was premised on greater diversification of the Russian economy to try to insulate itself from the vicissitudes of the energy price. Sounds, sounds like a pretty reasonable, uh, reasonable way, to, way to go. And um, when Mr. Medvedev became, became president, uh, this was then described as modernization. And that was the, has been the theme of the Medvedev president, presidency, the modernization of, of Russia and the Russian, and the Russian, Russian economy. That's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, I don't think there is any actual formal definition of the term modernization. Um, and uh, I've spent a fair amount of time in Russia the last, last year and heard a lot of different definitions of how they understand uh, moder modernization. And, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of, people will equate modernization with diversification. Um, well, I think that's kind of problematic. Uh, you know, the Soviet economy actually was a lot more diverse, uh, less dependent, uh, relatively speaking, on uh, uh, natural resource ex exports, although it was still very dependent upon them. But they did produce a lot of, uh, a lot of consumer, consumer goods. They were crappy, uh, and it was a command economy. And the command economy was, was more diverse, but it was a tremendous misallocation of resources because they weren't being done according to market, market signals. Um, even in the, and the Russians recognized, recognized this, and if you, even in the innovation scenario under their, in their own terms, uh, the, the optimal level of, of in, uh, of change in what high technology and so-called innovative sectors would constitute, uh, would constitute a driver of economic growth in the future is fairly modest, uh, certainly less than less than uh, less less than less than 10 percent. So I just I I emphasize that because um, there's so much discussion at a fairly superficial level that uh, uh, really kind of tends to equate at least in the Russian context, modernization with diversification. And the one thing I want you to take away with from this is that the amount of diversification uh, that would make sense from the standpoint of take, using your comparative advantage uh, and responding to market, market signals, you know, in the near to medium term, I'd say up to 2020 and 2030, uh, is modest. Let's not overestimate that. Now, the Russians, President Medvedev probably doesn't do himself a favor, actually, by overestimate, by overselling this, because he'll often speak about, you know, the, 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 primi the primitiveness of reliance upon natural resource exports, and that that's a bad thing. Well, there could be worse things, I suppose, in Russia's case, if you didn't have the, national, the natural, natural resources. Now, the counter-argument, of course, is the, uh, the, res the resource curse being, well, if they didn't have the nat natural, natural resources, then the Russians would have developed other, other means uh, to drive e economic growth. Um, that's true to an, to an extent. Now, let me talk a little bit more specifically, and let's skip, if we could, to the, the, uh, the slides on the, uh, uh, the, the high technology sectors and look a little more closely at what, 
what the Russians have, have uh, uh, are focusing on in this modernization, uh, so-called innovation economy framework. Um, first, and this is based upon a, uh, a chapter in an excellent book, which I coincidentally uh, co-wrote or co edited uh, with Anders Osland and uh, Sergei Guriev, Anders Osland of the Peterson Institute and Sergei Guriev, the rector of the New Economic School in Russia, called Russia After the uh, Global Economic Crisis. And uh, I will immodestly say it's a great book, um, and, uh, but more modestly, it's a great book because I wrote very little of it. Uh, but it's a very good collection of, uh, of various pieces uh, that capture, I think, the political, economic, social, uh, dynamics of what's going on in, in Russia with a lot of empirical data to, to, to back it up. And what this is based upon is the analysis done by uh, a couple of economists at Ran the RAND Corporation, Keith Crane and Arthur Usanov. So um, the five high-tech areas the Russians have uh, identified are software, nanotech, uh, civilian nuclear industry, aerospace, and armaments, defense. Um, most of the uh, most of the, the, the Soviet Union's major achievements in civilian technologies were tied to its military program. Well, in essence, the Soviet Union almost, uh, it was a military industrial complex, full stop. The, uh, of the 1990s, the domestic procurement for uh, those military goods fell tremendously by about 80% totally. Uh, in the, the period of high growth, 2000, 1998 to 2008, uh, the high-tech industry played a relatively small growth in driving the increase in, in Russian GDP. Now, uh, things that did uh, drive the, uh, the increase, in addition uh, to the, uh, the increase in the revenue coming in from the oil price, include retail wholesale trade, construction, transportation, telecommunications, uh, and Russia's recovery in the first decade of the, uh, the transition. But the industrial base uh, is uh, still very, very, it's very old, it's very obsolete. Uh, and a lot of it goes back to the, uh, the first uh, 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 industrialization under Stalin back in the, uh, the 1930s. Okay, let's look a little bit more closely about these, these, these five sectors. Next, please. Um, software and information technologies. Uh, there's been considerable success in this, this sector. Um, <clears throat> so in 1999, McKinsey estimated that uh, this highest labor productivity in the Russian economy was in this sector at about 38 percent, but 38 uh, percent of the U.S. level, uh, which is about twice the average Russian level. But the gross revenues, uh, even just two years ago, are rel quite modest, about uh, five and a half billion. Um, the IT sector has been one of the most open s industries in Russia. It has higher wages in, the I in, in, I than, in IT than uh, China or India. So it's not going to be, I think, uh, a leader in offshore IT business. It's, uh, uh, but it is expanding its presence in the offshore development market and in packaging software. Um, development of their sector is going to depend on making the country's business environment friendlier. Now, this business friend friendly environment, uh, in many, many, many uh, measurements of this, of course, the Russians do very poorly. Things like Transparency International, uh, the uh, the World Economic, the Davos uh, competi Competitiveness, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the story we know well about the very weak uh, legal system and the problems of corruption. And this is a sector that really uh, suffers from that uh, uh, quite a bit. But it has some strengths. Nanotechnology, quickly. Um, the, the Russians identified nanotechnology a few years ago as a, uh, as a high, high priority, and they created this uh, state-owned corporation. Uh, Ross Nano, and they actually put at the, put at the head of it one of the most uh, competent, I think, administrators and managers in Russia, and Anatoly Chubias, and it was fairly well capitalized with about uh, five billion dollars. Subsequently, it was drawn back a little bit uh, uh, with the impact on the Russian budget of the, ec of the economic crisis, but still, the uh, uh, their investments in nanotech uh, have exceeded a billion dollars, so falling behind only the United States and, and Japan. But their innovation activity uh, has been relatively modest. It's probably too early, too early to tell, but just if you look at one, one measurement, Russia ranks 16th in the number of patents related to, uh, to nano, nano, nanotechnology. The uh, expectations in the, in the near term uh, uh, that Crane and Usanov have for, for nanotech are fairly modest, and a lot of it's going to be in the, uh, the area of, uh, of um, scientific uh, machinery, things like uh, 
um, microscopes and, the, and such. Next, please. A more significant uh, industry for Russia certainly is the civilian nuclear uh, in industry. Um, several years ago, uh, the Russians, well, the Russians oc occupy about 16, 17 percent of the, uh, the global civilian nuclear uh, market. Uh, they aspire in the next uh, 10 years or so to get about 25 percent of the global, um, the global market. Uh, and the nuclear industry does constitute uh, domestically about uh, seven, also about 16, 17 percent of uh, power generation within Russia, and they have the same goal that, uh, that the nuclear industry will uh, occupy about 25 percent of Russian power generation domestically, free up uh, more uh, domestically produced gas for, for export, export sales. Their big advantage here is that they are the largest, uh, they have the largest capacity for uranium enrichment. They have the lowest cost of, uh, of enrichment in the world, making it one of the uh, most competitive industries in the world market. Uh, they also have some considerable uh, assets in um, uh, pieces of, of uh, uh, advanced reactor uh, technologies. Aerospace. Um, rockets, satellites, civilian aerocrafts, Still a leader in, uh, in launchers. Proton rocket will be the, uh, remain the only well-tested rocket capable of uh, ferrying people and heavy payloads into space for the foreseeable future. Uh, since the 1990s, the space program has depended upon commercial launch contracts and collaborative activities with other countries and foreign companies for survival. Uh, the Russian government has tried to uh, consolidate the civilian, civilian aircraft industry. They, created this big hold, holding company, United Aircraft Corp Corporation, uh, with major uh, transport aircraft design bureaus and production facilities be, all being merged into, into the, to the company. The, the story here on civilian, uh, civilian uh, the future of Russian civilian aircraft, um, as opposed to military aircraft, is that they're really going to need to partner with uh, Western, Western companies. And this is the story with the MS-21. It's the story of the, uh, uh, the other com major commercial uh, aircraft projects that the Russians have underway. Um, and it's, it's, it's a reflective of, I think, the, uh, the role that, the extent that Russia's gonna, Russian production and manufacturers are going to play a significant role in high-tech uh, innovation industries, uh, a lot of it's going to have to be in partnership with um, other players. And the Russians thinking of themselves, especially IT, for example, also here, as where are they going to fit in global value chains? Um, armaments, uh, of course, this was a, a huge relative strength of the Soviet e economy. Um, still, the Russians are a large exporter of uh, of arms, the second largest in the world to the United States. Uh, but there's been tremendous erosion uh, to the R&D capacity of the Russian military uh, sector, um, aging of the, uh, uh, of the, work, the, work, the work sector. Um, the sector has been able to survive essentially, from the, especially in the 1990s, to what extent that it has. Uh, because of ex exports, because domestic procurement uh, almost fell off the, uh, uh, fell off the, uh, fell down to, to nothing or close, close, close to nothing. The um, here it's kind of ironic because we, we think of a of, of Soviet Soviet legacy of these you know huge companies, uh, huge industrial enterprises. Well, the, a problem actually for the for the Russian defense sector is that relatively, their companies are small and they have uh, fairly low low low, va low, low valuations. Um, and so again, I think that it, th looking at future future development, uh, it's going to be increasingly uh, in concert with other uh, foreign foreign producers. The uh, next please. And that's. I think the lar larger story. The Russian leaders perceive growth in high technology industries as key to defining Russia's future place in the world economy, but uh, the Russian policy to encourage growth in high tech to this point has not been, that, not been that effective. And a reason for that is that Russian policymakers have attempted to foster high tech industries 
uh, in many cases by consolidating existing manufacturers into large state-controlled agglomerates, especially in armaments, nuclear industry, and aerospace. Even if still in the armaments, they're rel relatively small by, by international standards, um, looking at European defense companies and American, American defense companies. The, uh, <clears throat> and this has been what Mr. Putin uh, started doing in 2006, 2000, 2007. And this has been a, uh, uh, a fairly noticeable piece of so-called industrial planning. Uh, and uh, I can only say that I would agree with, uh, with Charles how he was characterizing industrial planning in the, the, chi the Chinese case. Uh, that it, you know, Putin, the, the rationale for the Russians to do this is that, well, we need to have national champions so they can compete internationally with other large international companies. Um, there's not much evidence to support that that is a, a, uh, a policy that will be effective. And the more, I think, that uh, uh, Russian government will help its uh, entrepreneurs think about uh, where they actually fit in, uh, in global value, value chains uh, is uh, going to be the, the, way, the way to go. And, but still, uh, the bottom line is that if you look at 2008, um, you know, industrial output our high tech sector of industrial output was about 9.8 percent. Industrial output, all told, was about 30 percent of Russia's GDP. So therefore, the high tech sector, you know, currently is contributing about three to four percent of uh, Russian Russian GDP. Uh, fairly marginal, uh, not insignificant, but uh, fairly fairly marginal. This is not going to be the big driver of growth for the Russian economy in the in the future. And just one last, one last word, because I found this kind of an interesting study, um, because most of the studies that look at Russian competitiveness, uh, business environment, et cetera, you know, put Russia in very, very, very uh, uh, <laughs> unsavory territory with Zambia and, <laughs> and uh, you know, 180 countries, Russia ranks 145 or so, something like that. Well, I came across uh, uh, this recent uh, Deloitte Global Manufacturing Competitiveness Index, and I do not vouch for the, uh, the methodology behind here, but I just found the results interesting. Um, that, and this is a, the, the survey was done by, by global CEOs uh, as to which countries uh, were, would be, have the most, manuf have the most uh, manufacturing competitiveness and today and, and will, in the, will in the future. And these are the, the criteria uh, ranked uh, from most significant to least significant, the 10 most important criteria they see when they rank uh, global competitiveness. And you can see it's, a, it's not surprisingly, it's a much wider set of criteria than simply looking at the, um, the legal environment uh, and the issue of, of corruption, where obviously Russia doesn't do very well. You know, number three, energy costs and policies. Well, Russia does better there because they're relatively low domestic energy costs. Number one, talent-driven innovation. Uh, you know, Russians do relatively well there. You know, number two, cost of labor and materials, not so much. That's a big comparative advantage of China, et cetera. Let's go to the last one, and I'll, then I'll shut up, because this is where it came out. Currently, Russia uh, came in uh, 20th place, uh, ahead of Italy, South Africa, France, Belgium, Argentina, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, but of more interest was their, their expectations for the future, and that uh, Russia in five years would move, would be the biggest mover of all of these countries. We go to the next, next slide, please. And that Russia would move from 20th to 14th place. So uh, here we go, a, uh, a significant report uh, like uh, the BRIC report seven, eight years ago with a rather uh, optimistic uh, uh, sense of Russia's future. So on that optimistic note, let me conclude. Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, let's go to our talented pool of participants out here. Questions? Please. Go ahead. Uh, here's, here's the mic coming. Thank you. Uh, th this is about China, and the question is addressed to Mr. Freeman. Um, I was struck uh, in your talk, if I understand it correctly, about uh, uh, th this model uh, of China model, whatever that model may be, uh, it, it is not uh, as successful as, as, as people may think. I think that's what you're saying. Uh, you gave the example of the state-run companies, for example, not being very profitable. Um, on the other hand, I think uh, it's my view that China has achieved 
China's rise is is much broader than than just that. Obviously, um, it's it's been able to uh, turn around uh, a communist uh, nation into a market-oriented type of uh, nation in a very short period of time. Manages borders, its, its geostrategic relationships with its neighbors and the world. Its presence is Africa. That's a huge, uh, typically, uh, you know, a domain of Europe and and, and the U.S. and uh, is uh, achieve the kind of uh, growth, you know, 10% a year for 31 years um, at a scale and a speed that has never been seen for a nation uh, ever in the history of mankind, if I'm, if I'm correct. So I, I would see that as some kind of success, uh, if nothing, uh, and, and perhaps in looking at a, and of course it's the largest uh, country in the world, uh, five uh, five thousand year history that dwarfs uh, Europe. Um, uh, so to look at a model for China, perhaps if there is such a thing, uh, would have to be a much broader, uh, y y you know, uh, view of it uh, from that kind of historic perspective. I was wondering if you want to comment on that. Um, I don't disagree with that. The Chinese economy is extraordinarily successful, um, but I think the the, the panel is really about the industrial policies um, and whether those are successful. And I think in Chinese industrial policy making, um, Chinese economic policy for years and years and years has been predominated by focus on market reform. Again, you know, the kind of, uh, the, uh, the kind of getting out of the way and deregulation and removing barriers to trade and commerce, removing the barriers not just to international commerce but to intra-provincial, uh, or in, inter-provincial commerce that, that, uh, that are, are are enormously successful, building roads and rails and processes to move goods and services throughout throughout the Chinese economy. Um, that's been tremendous success. What I'm suggesting is that any industrial policies, if, ch if the Chinese policymakers in sitting in Beijing believe that the next wave of growth or that, that Chinese, China's future economic growth depends on the kind of narrow state-driven cap capitalism, the kind of growth that's reliant on uh, further empowering, further shoring up uh, these national champion state-owned enterprises, which is fundamentally what seems to have been the conclusion drawn by the, the majority of Chinese policymakers today, uh, I, I, would, I would be very cautious about China's future success if they really go down that road. My own, my own feeling, um, because um, uh, I do believe that if, if, if there is a, a country and a group of people which is more pragmatic than the Chinese, I, I don't know which ones they are, that they will re recognize the foolishness of, of the kind of industrial policy making path on which they're now trotting and will chuck, the, chuck it and chuck the people that are responsible for it um, in due course. But right now, if you have to say um, what will happen as a result of these policies, if they're generally shored up, I think that there will be a stumble and um, there will be some people that, whose heads will roll as a result. Um, but I, I certainly wouldn't argue for a moment that China's economic success has been extraordinary. I think it is. It is certainly a, of our age the story. And um, if one wants to talk about a Chinese model, which is a, in large part deregulation, focus on market reform um, to drive growth with some sort of uh, 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 wise uh, spending that, to, to try to increase the competitiveness of the Chinese economy, that I think I'd have to argue is a tremendous model, okay. but driving, drawing other other inferences and other other lessons from the from the the results of the of the crises, which suggest that you know the market is not the way to go. I think would be would be would be dangerous and is dangerous. There was a question right uh, right here, please. No, it's okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Keicho Nakaza from Japan International Cooperation Agency or JICA. Uh, I'm working in the field of international development and uh, very interested in uh, some lessons drawn from experiences in uh, some successful countries like uh, Brazil, uh, China, and you know, uh, Russia maybe, and not, not maybe Germany. But uh, you know, in many developing countries try to apply industrial policies, but you know, in many cases they failed. And they failed not because they are, uh, you know, using the uh, industrial policies uh, in a you know, mistaken way, but rather uh, they failed because they chose or selected 
uh, industries, uh, I mean, the, which would be losing. I mean, not the picking the winners, but picking the losers. And sometimes it's too ambitious or too, adv too advanced, depend, you know, uh, compared with the level of development or uh, the uh, endowment structure of those countries. And I wonder, uh, in the case of Brazil, or maybe in China, uh, or Russia, uh, how, or, you know, what kind of criteria those uh, governments used to select the industries to be protected or supported or uh, to be developed? And uh, I'd like to know the lessons uh, which we can utilize to other also, you know, other developing countries. Thank you. Kelly? In the case of Brazil, I mean, if you look at the sectors that have been identified, in most cases, they're sectors where there really is a national need for more, for lack of a better term, supply. So you're looking at infrastructure, you're looking at energy, you're looking at health care. Um, and, you know, truly, in those three sectors at least, I would say that the way that Brazil interprets their national interest is very much that you must have, um, you know, in the, in the same way that some countries may look at having, you know, homegrown food supplies or, or uh, a homegrown defense industry, viewing that as being in your national interest, I would say that in those three sectors, Brazil views those equally, equally as such. I think that where the challenge may end up coming um, is that, I mean, the, the bottom line is, you know, Brazil's prospects going forward, just given the growth dynamics globally, the demand in China uh, and elsewhere in Asia and globally, et cetera, is positive enough that I would say that most companies, be them foreign companies or Brazilian companies, are looking at really investing more and growing their operations in Brazil, no matter what the industrial policy is. So. I guess a, a concern or fear that I would have going forward is that if you, as a government, overthink that a little bit too much and try to overly encourage by forcing localization policies, by imposing binational policies, et cetera, in an era where all companies, no matter where they're based, you know, by definition, unless you're talking some of these overly programmatic <laughs> situations in China, uh, et cetera, have global supply chains, um, I think that inherently you're limiting the, um, either the extent to which companies can continue to grow and or the level to which you know, you're going to reach technologically with those investments. Because if you can't tap into those global supply chains, um, at a certain point it is going to, it is going to limit your ability, your ability to go forward. But in Brazil I would say that you know, the, the definition of sectors, getting to your question, very much came out of you know necessity for the market. If I hear domestic uh, market, not uh, exports, uh, to start. I remember one of the uh, statistics you had, Kelly, was that Brazil uh, trade is 30 percent of the GDP in Brazil, whereas 65 percent in China. And what I think I hear you saying is that Brazil's so-called industrial policy is focused on domestic rather than export growth. I think so far, yes. I mean, it, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you'll, you'll find that uh, in Brazil, uh, first of all, just you know, informally surveying companies that are doing business in Brazil right now, um, for example, on this new binational policy, there was a very low level of concern about that policy writ large, primarily because what you'll hear just anecdotally from most companies is, look, we're going to continue to invest in our operations and our manufacturing capacity just to keep up with Brazilian needs and Brazilian growth. So at least, I mean, looking at it from a short-term perspective, that's how the companies are looking at it. It certainly is how the government is, is looking at it. And that 30% is actually a huge increase from mm -hmm. when I originally yeah. started working on Brazil. That number was like 10, yeah. um, uh, you know, when I first moved there at the, at the time the Plano Hale first came in. So yeah. it, even that is a, is a huge advance. But you'll find that even um, these, you know, Brazilian multinationals, the multiprazis, um, even in Brazil have come under criticism to some extent when they have made major investments overseas, major operations in China or Russia or Africa. Um, there's been something of a, of a domestic um, you know, backlash or reaction to that saying, well, hey, you're a Brazilian company. You need to be creating jobs in Brazil. 
Does that sound familiar to us Americans? Yes, it does. But but you know, so you'll see a large American company or large, excuse me, Brazilian companies taking out full page ads in the Brazilian newspapers saying, you know, we employ Brazilians. It's something that's, you know, I guess a bit unusual and, and does, Bill, to your point, kind of reinforce mm -hmm. the idea that the domestic market is still not the only focus, but, but a big focus. Rick, uh, the last question we, we had on this agenda was how is the policy making environment uh, responding to successes and failures? I'd like to ask more how is it responding to the perceived risk? Uh, Germany, in this particular uh, conversation, uh, is unusually dependent upon exports to China. And Germany also faces the, the challenge of dealing with the, uh, the problems in Europe. I'm not sure that I get a sense of their, the, the degree of flexibility they have in responding to, to the threat of a Chinese bubble burst, for example, or a similar action in Portugal or Spain. Well, <clears throat> that's a very good question, and, and in fact, they early on in the uh, financial crisis, uh, they did face a, a very substantial drop-off in exports. What is interesting was how quickly they adapted and, uh, and uh, 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 diversified their whole approach to exports. I mean, China, correctly, uh, is a very important growth market for them. But, uh, but they don't rely simply on China. I mean, as, uh, as uh, Andy knows, they have become uh, the, uh, uh, the Russian Federation's number one economic partner. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they are the, the largest exporter to Russia. They are now, they've discovered India, and they, uh, they're their business uh, leaders are all over India as well as uh, Latin America. Uh, I, one thing I should have said is, uh, while in my view, and I'll speak you know very candidly here, while German politicians are not a very impressive lot, sort of similar to ours, uh, I think they probably have the f the highest quality. Uh, managerial class in the world. Uh, it's hard to meet a German CEO who doesn't have a PhD, who doesn't have a great grasp of history, who can't discuss uh, classical music and art. They are very well educated strategic thinkers and they are internationalists. And, uh, and, you, and, and they understand like, uh, well, in a way similar to, say, uh, a Dutch uh, business manager because they, they need to export as well, or a Finn, uh, they rely on being able to penetrate foreign markets and, uh, and thus, I think, are, are very successful at it. Now, the Euro crisis really poses some very serious challenges. And uh, I think, but their uh, approach to that crisis in the short term is to uh, is to recognize that with with lower growth likely in the rest of uh, Euroland, uh, they're going to have to export beyond Euroland. So I don't think they can make the same assumptions. They're going to be able to sell, for example, as many BMWs or Mercedes in Spain uh, or Portugal as they did uh, uh, before. But of course, the big markets are not in Spain and Portugal. So. Uh, in, unless there is a, a fundamental collapse in world trade, I think the, the Germans will, uh, will do just fine. The really more interesting question is, I think, is what are they going to do about the euro? Because for the first time uh, in, recent, uh, in recent memory, the, uh, the requ their requirement to, to stand up and engage in these bailouts, uh, Greece, Ireland, mm -hmm. Portugal, potentially Portugal and others, has really led to a domestic backlash at home. And you yeah. can imagine it if you saw that in American terms. What if we were suddenly bailing out because of the Mexicans or the Canadians or NAFTA? I mean, uh, and this is Might be closer to home. Might be California. Yeah. <laughs> uh, They'll bail us out. <laughs> but uh, it, it, these are massively uh, uh, unpopular. Yeah. 
And, uh, and if, in fact, the price is going to be continuing bailouts coupled with uh, the potential for uh, stimulus policies and the, ex and, and the, the uh, unwillingness of their European partners to accept fiscal restraint, you could very well have, I think, uh, a, a decision taken by the, by the German establishment, say, in the next 18 months to two years, to return to the Deutsche Mark. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the core. A sound currency is the core not only of, of German uh, economic policy, but their sort of political identity. That's perfect. We're, we're drawing to the conclusion. So one quick last question with the highest hand back there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Allison Johnson, and I thought the panel was very fascinating. I'm building a smart power initiative at Northrop Grumman Corporation, sort of looking at how U.S. foreign policy is uh, affecting uh, some of these uh, amazing changes around the world. And I'm really interested, as the discussions are going on in Cancun uh, by the United Nations, how these BRICs, or including Germany, have really attacked their industrial policy as it relates to our climate to our environment. Um, having worked in all of these countries, I have been very struck by how the Germans were very, you know, aware that their industrial policy could not ruin the environment that they lived in. And you find that when they work around the world. Whereas the rest of the BRICs uh, cannot say as strongly an acknowledgement that, you know, pollution and environmental degradation are some of the consequences of their industrial policy. So if, if the panelists could comment on that, and also how the developing world can either use these models or not, uh, because they have to consider this as they grow as well and how it affects our planet. Thank you. Since it's such a simple question, can I ask you all to give it at least a minute? <laughs> let, let me just say a word about Germany, because this is fundamentally different than either the, the BRIC countries or the United States, for that matter. I mean, there has been a, uh, a, a an organized environmentalist mentality and movement in Germany for 30 years. I mean, they have probably the most successful uh, Green Party in the world. In fact, the Green Party t today is now, according to the latest poll in Spiegel, is larger than the Social Democrats. So it's the second largest wow. party in Germany. And it just gives you some sense wow. of their popularity. The Germans have, sh have, have, as you know, shut down all their nuclear reactors. So they have no nuclear reactors, in great distinction to their, their neighbors in, in France. Uh, they uh, they uh, have become, in part, so closely tied to the Russian uh, economy because they, they are such large export, uh, importers of Russian natural gas uh, because of their uh, environmental movement. And, uh, and uh, there is just, a, a, just a, a political consensus from left to right that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, conservation, environmentalism, is, is next to godliness, if, if not in an increasingly German secular culture, ahead of godliness. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the amazing thing is, is it's clear that they have paid a major economic price to do this. And when you think about the costs which they subsidize things like biodiesel and, uh, and wind energy and solar energy, I mean, it rains most of the time in Germany, but they say, yeah, that they, when you add that to the cost of integrating the, 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 the German Democratic Republic, the uh, East Germany, and, and the fact that they have been able to absorb those two big price tags and still come out as one of the best performing economies in the world, it just, it, it, you, you sort of understand how Germany almost won World War II, fighting Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union collectively. I mean, they are a highly talented, motivated, and disciplined people. Okay. Yeah. 
Just a quick point on Brazil. I mean, I think Brazil's case is a little bit unique because their energy grid is just naturally so green. If you go back nine years ago when you had the energy crisis in Brazil due to the droughts, the reason was because about 80 percent of their energy was coming off of hydro. They moved to more diversification um, after that point because it, they realized it was such a vulnerability. Um, and their challenge has been really, particularly since they've made these massive pre-salt finds, which, you know, getting them out of the ground is going to be a lot harder than finding them. Um, but a, a, a major debate that they're having within the country now is, uh, you know, how can they continue to diversify their energy grid so that it remains quite dependent on hydro, um, but does take in some of these other, uh, you know, wind energy, et cetera. They did the first wind bid. Uh, last year since they developed their ProInfa, their wind program about five years ago. They finally, you know, are kind of getting off the dime and moving forward on these things. So I think that you'll see um, a continuing focus on ensuring, and, and obviously in Brazil in the 70s during the, ener the uh, oil crisis, they developed their now famous, you know, ethanol program. So they are very heavily dependent upon bioethanol and biodiesel um, from, from sugarcane. So uh, you'll, you'll continue to see that being a very important part of um, Brazilian development going forward is, is maintaining a green energy grid um, and, and further diversifying it. Where Brazil historically has been looked at with, you know, more of a, a critical eye has been in agriculture, right? Um, and, and, you know, that's something where uh, I think both uh, because of a strong recognition in the Brazilian public, the government, um, NGOs have become more involved in Brazil as well, much to the Brazilian government's frustration at times, I think, but that is an issue that is being looked at um, as far as deforestation of the Amazon uh, biome uh, a lot more carefully uh, and a lot more strategically. Andy? Thanks. Uh, great, great question. Uh, there's been some interesting movement on that in the last couple of years in, in, in Russia. Uh, you know, in the, during the Putin presidency, uh, the Russians were not uh, particularly enthusiastic about, about the Kyoto Protocol. His chief economic advisor, Andrei Ilyanov, was an avid opponent of the Kyoto Protocol, uh, going through copious uh, uh, calculations that this would be a hindrance on economic growth in the longer term for uh, for Russia. The Russians did uh, cede to the protocol, essentially, with, but it was a transactional agreement uh, with the, for the European Union to support their WTO accession if the Russians, Russians did that. Now, what's happened in the last couple of years is interesting, uh, and this is, I think, part of the wake-up call of the, uh, the global economic crisis has had for, the, for, the, for the, the, Rus the Russian leadership. You know, Russia is one of the most uh, energy inefficient uh, uh, countries in the, in the world, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the potential savings that they can, they can have for their, uh, for their economy and uh, in uh, becoming more energy efficient, and the numbers are quite are quite staggering. That's had an Im Im impact on them, uh, and also dr driven by as a, as a major energy energy producer. Uh, this will if you, you lose you, you lose use less domestically than you can ex export more. Um, and it was a major World Bank study that came out in uh, December of 2000, 2008, and we I think this has been pushing uh, the Medvedev government to be a little more proactive on this. Um, it's a great question. I mean, um, and it, it gives me the opportunity to say that, that CSIS has recently published a, uh, a piece called Green Dragons, which actually looked at, at um, Asian approaches to, to climate change and from a, a, both a domestic politics um, and an industrial policy approach. So uh, look for that at CSIS.org. Um, but the, the um, you know, the, the China, you know, is, is obviously an autocracy and so has less uh, perhaps of a <laughs> A direct um, uh, uh, concern for I mean there is no Green Party in China um, and uh, and uh, there is unlikely to be for some time but you won't go broke looking at China Chinese political Chinese policy uh, through a prism that that assumes a, a fundamental concern by the Chinese Communist Party uh, for their political future and for their 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 role as the quote legitimate uh, governing entity in China so most Chinese policies are taken with a view to how do they manage, um, uh, how do they preserve their own, their own uh, primacy. And, and climate change policy is, is certainly part and parcel of that, that exercise. Um, fundamentally, the Chinese government has done a, a back-of-the-envelope calculation that they need 8% annual growth in order to provide 50,000 
GDP growth in order to provide 50,000 new jobs a day, and that 50,000 new jobs a day reduces the chances of political instability that will result in their having to, to deal with, with, with local unrest. So any challenge to 8% annual GDP growth is going to be a source of political concern. Certainly worrying about um, in, in, um, uh, in putting in place hard caps or commitments on climate change is something the Chinese government is going to be assiduously opposed to. Um, and is going to make every exercise, every effort in, in global discussions to reduce. That said, they, there is a certain amount of sincerity, actually a fair amount of sincerity, about reducing environmental um, um, degradation in China because it's a political problem, because the, the, there are increasing protests and about health-related concerns related to environment. So there is an effort to try to reduce the environmental degradation, and it's sincere. It's just that they don't want anybody from the outside uh, reducing their flexibility in, in, in growth. Um, the, the last piece of this puzzle is, you know, like a lot of, uh, of, of countries, um, China is trying to promote a domestic green technology industry, in part because there is a widespread belief in China that, um, that Kyoto and the sort of green technology movement around the world is a plot by the West to try to keep China down for the, for the next wave of industrial growth. So there is a strong industrial uh, policy, political attempt to promote green technology in China to the, um, to the, to the, to the, to the deterrence of, 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 other, of other countries' abilities to produce that by producing, uh, by, by giving, using the scale of the Chinese economy to promote, to promote these kinds of products. Um, does that mean we have a green technology war in the future? It's certainly possible. I think at a minimum you've, you've got um, a little bit of a green technology bubble going on um, in China and, and arguably elsewhere. Is that a terrible thing? No, because it just promotes more and more green technologies that eventually will be, will be um, valuable, but it means a lot of people will go broke in the process of trying to, to capitalize on the green technology wave. I'll have to say that. I, uh, I'm going to wrap it up. Excuse me. Thank you very much. With the one or two thoughts, first of all, I. Uh, I love the last question. I just got back uh, last month from Shanghai where I spoke to uh, an expo conference on uh, green cities. And I, my sense is that there's a substantial increase in interest in China, in part because it's an economic growth opportunity. Uh, and maybe in, in terms of exports, their clean coal technology is arguably better than ours. And uh, they're making enormous progress in a number of other areas. I just finished uh, yesterday looking at a McKinsey study on the urbanization of China, and I brought just two, two numbers here. In the next 15 years, they're going to have 350 million more people in their cities. <laughs> they, they're going to have 221 cities with more than a million people. Uh, Europe has 35 today. The uh, the building that they got to do, 50,000 new high-rise buildings, 50,000, which is 10 times that of New York City. So I mean, they have got to deal with some serious problems. And that probably is the, is the way to uh, conclude. The thing that I have been li listening to uh, with some interest is the conundrum that Politicians in all of these countries, whether they are authoritarian or, or they're all politicians in one, one way or another, except North Korea, maybe, but uh, uh, the Chinese government has to respond because it faces that problem of people flooding into the cities, the need to create 50,000 new jobs a month. Um, if you look at what every country is trying to do, they're trying to solve their domestic problems with, with exports. Now, I, I think I could make the Adams Smith argument that if everybody exported the things that they did best, we probably would have global uh, growth at an astonishing pace. The problem is when you talk about industrial policy where political judgment is imposed, then you may be competing uh, as to who has the best right to develop this particular industrial area. And that's when we get into trouble. Uh, the, the worry that I have is that uh, we, we've got some serious problems facing these countries. Political systems are slow to respond. 
and we face the question of whether or not we can respond uh, quickly enough with industrial policies or whether uh, there are other ways we can gather our our best judgments together and, and achieve a more global response that uh, that deals with the, the problems. We, we've got bubbles coming. We have the potential of not just dot-coms in the states or subprime. You've got a Chinese bubble with, with potential. All of these things drive us to look at the question, um, do we have uh, the capacity to adjust quickly enough to keep from falling off another cliff? That's uh, that's a matter for another conversation. But uh, I want to thank the panel for some really remarkably thoughtful <laughs> comments.